Perfetto, let's start. Oh, here we are back in Barolo. Um, let's see where uh, Maccarini is. Well, as we probably already know, everybody know probably, Maccarini is in uh, La Morra, he's here. And it's uh, located in uh, the center northern part of the Barolo region, which is this one. But the um, linear screw, La Serra and Brunate, are those two, are basically, as we can see from this view, in the middle of uh, Barolo. I'm gonna just now zoom in a bit so we can have a closer look. Okay, here we are. So here is uh, Marcarini with its winery and uh, here are the vineyards used by Marcarini to produce its uh, Barolo. But before going back to the vineyards, Manuel, could you tell us um, some information about the winery and the especially? Sure, uh, the winery is, is, uh, has a very long uh, uh, history. Uh, actually, uh, at the moment with my Andrea and uh, Elisa and my other daughter who is not present, but she's in charge of about the, the in incoming, uh, they, are, they, they represent the sixth generation. Uh, in fact, um, the first Marcarini uh, was a um, um, general from the army. It was called Sebastiano Marcarini. And uh, he was um, a fan and uh, a big um, lover of, of its land in La Morra. Uh, he, you, he started making the Barolo from the Brunate vineyard at that time and used uh, the, the wine to, put, to bring it to the court of to the king, to the king of Italy in Torino. Because uh, at that time, we are talking about the 1800s, end of the 1800s, he was the tutor of the son of the king. And he was uh, the, the first who brought and put together the vineyards. Before that, they were owned by the Marchesa Faletti. So all the land here was owned by the Faletti family. So when she decided to give away the land, uh, all the small, uh, all the workers and the people start buying uh, the land from the Marchesa Faletti. So that's how uh, we came in uh, in, in possess uh, or of the land, thanks to the uh, Sebastiano, to this general Sebastiano Marcarini. Uh, then his son, uh, later on, uh, it was a railroad engineer. And this uh, in engineer, he was called Giulio Marcarini, uh, didn't live from the, from the wine. Actually, it was also his passion. And he was uh, building railroads in uh, North Africa uh, during the Second World War when uh, the Italy wanted to become uh, uh, very, an, uh, again, an empire. Uh, and uh, he was uh, building the roads in Eritrea and Somalia and these areas. Uh, his um, good point and his, um, what he did of important for the history of the winery Marcarini was uh, that in 1933, and then it ended in 1934, was one of the founders of the Consorzio di Tutela del Barolo. And uh, he had a very a long view on that time because uh, before the Second World War, uh, it was already uh, felt the, necess the necessity of uh, in making a good quality wine and to rule it and to avoid uh, fakes and to uh, put uh, the conditions to make uh, the wine uh, in, a, in a good quality. And that was his uh, importance for our winery. Uh, then it came uh, the notaio, my wife's grandfather, and he was called uh, Giuseppe Marcarini. And he also uh, had a, a, a big, big, big love of, of wine, probably because he inherited it. And he had a big, important uh, process in the winery. Actually, he uh, started selling the wine with the label you know today. Uh, his was also very important 
because he also started um, designating the single vineyards, uh, even though it was already done in the past, but not on the labels as today in, in, in the market. So since 1958 vintage, we have our bottles in the market uh, labeled with the single vineyard on it. Then it came the time of my uh, mother-in-law, was Anna Marcarini with his husband, my father-in-law, uh, Giovanni Bava. And they had a, vi a big uh, importance in the winery because they founded the uh, company as today. So they founded the Azienda Agricola. Before was not a company because um, also the laws were totally different, but uh, the, the company started as having a figure, a juridical fi figure in, in the, um, in the world. And uh, they brought also some other pieces into the vineyard and they start also selling other great varieties of wine like the Dolcetto and the Barbera. And then it came my turn and my wife, my wife's turn. And uh, we continue and we were the first generation who only lived with the Barolo, with wines. All the previous generations, the, the winery was only part of, of uh, their income. Uh, for my wife and myself, it was, we live only with this income and the winery had to become more important. And we give uh, also um, a, a different uh, aspect and more modern aspect to the winery. And now the sixth generation is uh, my Andrea that you met already and maybe uh, you're going to meeting tonight and my daughter Elisa and my other daughter Chiara. These three, my three children, entered the winery recently. Uh, they all love uh, the wine and what is involved with the winemaking and the vineyards, of course. Especially Elisa, she loves the vineyards. Andrea loves uh, the part, the, the managing aspect and the, he, when there is a fight, uh, in the family, always Andrea comes to settle down the, <laughs> the uh, old people. And Chiara, she is a chef, she likes to cook, and so she was in charge to manage uh, our hotel, small hotel, Agriturismo, and the small restaurant that is there. So everybody is busy. I am uh, already almost 60 years old, so I'm ready mm -hmm. to, to relax a little bit more and enjoy uh, this this work with uh, without all the problems that it can have. <laughs> uh, this is a, a little bit about the, the the history. Maybe a little bit boring, but uh, anyway, it is um, part of uh, our family and how we get there. Um, so, if you want to go, we can go more into the details of the vineyards. Yeah, sure, man. So, we are based in La Morra. Uh, La Morra is a, a, an old town, it's in the top of the hill, and uh, it was founded uh, in 1201. So it is not very, very old. Uh, actually, it are the fractions, what today are considered fractions of La Morra, which were older and more important, because the, the, the fractions were right at the same level of the vineyards. And the people who work in the vineyards used to live in these fractions and were more important than La Morra. La Morra became important because as a, for a strategic reason. Being high in elevation, they can control all the surroundings mm -hmm. from the invasions of the, the people that can invade um, the city or the area. Uh, together with Barolo, were the only two towns that the royal family, the Faletti family, used to have a permanent residence. All the other castles that you can find in the region, like Serra Lunga, Castiglione Faletto, or, or Monforte, or Rotti, uh, were dedicated mostly for the army to protect the area. So they were all under the Faletti family, but were used for protecting uh, the, the, the area and to collect the, the taxes and to manage all this. Uh, the, the, the government actually of this area. Mm -hmm. But La Morra, uh, the castle was burned many, many years ago, so we, have, we do not have any more a castle. But our winery is right in the center of uh, the older town, 
and uh, our building, our house, is, uh, was constructed in the 1300s. So we have a, a part of it that it's from very old, and then all the winery is very old in the inside. So it was always dedicated for making wine. Uh, La Morra is very important because, uh, as in the Barolo area, uh, makes one third of the production of the Barolo. So it's 11 little towns, communes, that makes Barolo, but La Morra is the biggest, and one third of the production comes from this area. So this is uh, important because La Morra has a lot of uh, producers and a lot of land. In the La Morra area, um, there is a hill, special hill that faces south. Uh, you can see now the, uh, where we have the vineyards. Uh, there are three important or three major historical vineyards in this area. That is called La Serra, where we make uh, uh, the single vineyard uh, wine. We have uh, Cerecchio, which we do not have property in it, but it's in between La Serra and Brunate. And there is Brunate, which I just mentioned, the third very important uh, historical vineyard. Uh, these vineyards uh, were established uh, in 2010, like it's called MGA, Mencione Geografica Giuntiva. In 2010, uh, it was established, which are the limits uh, of these areas. And La Serra increased the surface. Actually, La Serra was much smaller in the past than it became in 2010. You know also, it's not in, in, uh, in France, in Bordeaux, uh, Napoleon arrived and established which are the premier crew, the grand crew and the village and all the things. In our area, we are more democratic and uh, all the producers together uh, agree on the limits and in the surface in 2010, uh, which were the limits. So La Serra was a little bit expanded. Brunate was more difficult to expand, actually is only slightly bigger than it used to be. And uh, the, actually is more or less the same surface. Brunate is, uh, uh, has a dimension, uh, is uh, 28 hectares. So that is about 70 acres of, uh, of um, size. Uh, we own 4.5 acres in the Brunate area. Uh, 3.5 hectares in the, in, the, in the Brunate area. So uh, these, together with Cereto, because Cereto property, which is our neighbor, was, it used to belong to Marcarini in the, in the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, we own the largest surface of Brunate. La Serra is slightly smaller, is 18 hectares. That's about... Uh, 44 acres and uh, it is uh, today. So we own four hectares in this area, only dedicated to Barolo. Of course, we have other uh, vineyards in these two places, which are not dedicated to Nebbiolo for Barolo, but are dedicated for the Barbera and for the Dolcetto that you know and we produce. So this is mostly uh, the two single vineyards. Uh, the two single vineyards uh, have uh, two characteristics. Now you can see in pink or, or uh, fuchsia, I don't know the color. It's, uh, yeah, here in pink. Let's yeah. see. In, in the fuchsia color is uh, evident the La Serra farm, our property. Uh, La Serra goes as, as like it's bigger, of course. Um, we have this area exactly, which uh, Gaetano is pointing. Uh, in, in the, I don't know if you can see it, but it's higher in elevation respect to the Brunate. Uh, actually, La Serra uh, goes uh, about from the 370 meters to 450 meters above the sea level. And our vineyard is about uh, around 380 to 400 meters above the sea level. Brunate goes is lower and makes a conch. It, it, it goes like a circle and mm -hmm. mix that with the Cerecchio. Exactly, where the, the little uh, arrow, it, that's Brunate, and you come to your uh, left, or to, to, yes, you go to Cerecchio, that's Cerecchio, and that makes an, a, like an, an amphitheater. 
And yeah. this amphitheater creates a microclimate which is different from La Serra, which is more in the top of the hill. In La Serra, you have more ventilation, more breeze, and uh, La Serra name uh, comes from the greenhouse because it's very mild, it's very even the temperature. There's not big excursions in temperature. While in Burnate, you have is less wind, is hotter, especially during the day, and colder during the night. This creates a, a different microclimate respect to La Serra, which uh, influence the wines. You will see later this with Elisa that will talk to you about that. Uh, just about the, the name, uh, La Serra, that, that I already tell that is uh, the greenhouse. Brunate is a different name. Uh, and it's interesting because tonight uh, I brought two of our very old uh, bottles. Uh, I will show you the label. Uh, if, if you can um, put it uh, Gaetano, I would like to show the label of the yeah. Brunate. Everybody is seeing that. Okay, you can see it now correctly? Yeah, sure. Okay, this is a 1934 vintage of Barolo Brunate. But if you take, uh, put attention, it's not written Brunate, it's written Brinate. And this is the original name of the Brunate. It is Brinate, that comes from frost. Frost because this area, there is a, a substance that covers the, the skin of the grapes that it's called the Pruina, which is white. And this area is very rich in this substance and it's a natural uh, protecting substance for the grapes. And it's, the, it's a lot of uh, this substance that makes the, the grapes like frozen. Uh, they look frozen because they are white. And this is why the origin of the name of the Brinate. Then during the, the Second World War, Mussolini tried to avoid and to unify the Italian and try to avoid all the Piedmontese and all the dialects. So I will show you uh, a different uh, uh, vintage, and this is was during the war. Uh, I don't know if you can see it now. Uh, it's you a can 19... Like this. A bit more. Okay, like this, like this, perfect. Perfect. This is a 1942 vintage, so it was during the Second World War. And you can see here, the name was already transformed into Brunate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is interesting. This is not everyone can, can have this, this part of history. And I will show you the last bottle. And this is the first, one of the first, uh, the first label. You can see it? Uh, yeah, like this, yeah. Okay, this is the first label that was done by the notary uh, Giuseppe Marcarini. And it's the label, the first label that uh, people met our winery. And you can see Brunate is written in this little piece. And we were uh, this. Good... Can, you, can you lower a bit the bottle because we don't see the Brunate actually. Like this? Uh, no, no, no. Mettila più lontano, più lontano, più lontano. Perfect. Okay. Okay, you can see that we uh, named the Brunate on the label. This makes our winery the first to designate single vineyards in, Bar in La Morra. What year? And probably in, in all Barolo. Say, Mike. What year is that? Uh, this is 1964. The first vintage was 1958 with the, this label. Okay. So this is only a little parenthesis to, to show. Uh, these areas were very historical. The names uh, of Brinate and La Serra appeared, the Brunate since the 1300s, and La Serra since the 1500s. And it is, this is due to the reason because these vineyards face south. And the southern uh, exposition is the best exposition when especially if the, the, the weather was different, could, you could uh, get um, more sun and you could get better uh, crops, better grapes from them. So now if you want Gaetano, we can go to see uh, the videos we made in the Brunate and in La Serra. And Elisa can explain, uh, probably can explain better about what we are doing and how we manage them. Uh, what about the selection, Manuel, of the... That's right. 
uh, the selection that, uh, the philosophy behind uh, where the wine is going. Yes, up. the philosophy that, that comes, uh, that we started, the new philosophy with the new generations coming. Uh, there is, since 2010, the MGA of La Morra. This didn't exist before. So we took advantage to use this appellation because as you can see, La Morra is quite big and we want to, to make a wine, first of all, that identifies and characterizes that has the characteristics of the wines of, uh, of the Tortonian soil, of La Morra. So these characteristics, uh, we want to show them uh, in the same concept of the French uh, do. You have the Grand Cru uh, or the Premier Cru, depending which area you are, uh, the Cru and the village. The village is what uh, La Morra wants to be. So wants to identify and to express the characteristics of La Mora soil, of the Tortonian soil. Uh, we started doing this wine since 2015 vintage, and it comes from part of La Serra and part of Brunate, and some parcels that are out of these two, that you can see, that you can see behind the Brunate especially. This one and uh, this one, and also in La Serra in the top, in the highest part, that one and in the lowest part of uh, La Serra as well. We use, we are concentrated of, in the heart of La Serra to improve the quality of La Serra and to make a better single vineyard wine. And we concentrate in the steepest part of the Brunate uh, to make, uh, and to make the, um, the, the selection of the best bunches of for, that goes or that are dedicated to the Brunate. Also, there is a little part uh, that is in the yellow and it's in the right side of, of your screen. And this is also Brunate, but this Brunate is not under the La Morra commune. So it's, that's under Barolo. So there is the border of Barolo there. And of course, uh, the, the grapes that comes from uh, uh, this um, parcel are dedicated only to Brunate, not to uh, the Barolo of La Morra. Uh, this La Barolo La Morra wants to be a Barolo that is uh, more ready to drink, to enjoy it sooner. It wants to have the same characteristics of uh, the Barolos from La Morra and wants to be a wine that can be, that you don't need to become old to drink it. Or uh, you want to drink it younger, you want to appreciate it sooner and do not want to be pretentious as La Serra and Bonate. La Serra Brunate, by, this, by the same time, uh, has improved the depth and the structure. And I think uh, we have never made as good as La Serra and as good as Brunate as we start doing them in 2015 and 2016, of course, vintage and the newer that are coming. Thank you. Should we move to the video? Yes, we can move to the video. Elisa will, uh, will explain and will comment uh, them. So, Elisa, you can come in the center. Elisa, we start with Brunate. Yes, yes. So, we are on the top of Brunate. Uh, so, you can see that it's very um, <clears throat> steep. We go where there are the trees, so very down in the hill. And we are doing in this day, uh, many times the walk from the lowest part to the higher part in this very, very hard walk. So you see now the vines that have uh, the, the buds quite high. So we're starting the work and you can see me that are taking some soil in my hand. And you see that the soil is white on the top. It means that it's dry. But if you dig a bit, you see that the soil become brown. So it means that there is humidity inside. We have the soil with a lot of clay, and thanks to the clay, we have humidity. So even the vintage like 2017, that were very without no rains, so no waters in the soil, we were lucky because thanks to the clay, our soil were very humidity. So the <clears throat> the grape uh, grow very well, and also all the wines and everything. 
<clears throat> Sorry, I need a glass of water. <laughs> so we can show the second <clears throat> video and we can see the La Serra. So this is the entrance of the Cascina. Cascina means a house, farm. So it's different. The, um, we, are, we are not so steep, so it's similar to be in flat. A glass of water <laughs> ahead, for me. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> You see, we both in Brunata and La Serra, we have the grass. We have controlled grassing, so it means we don't use chemical product to destroy it, but we use machine. You see that now the grass is a bit high. It's, this is because we um, want to have the first cut of the grass in May, because we have a second organic um, fertilization. Yeah, fertilization of the, the soil. And it's completely natural because we use the grass that grow in the, in the, in the lines. So uh, the, you see the pink house, that is the uh, Chabot Camerano, you know that's name from uh, the Barbera. And the, that was a house, very little house, where the family Camerano used to live. Our, um, our vineyards go on the left and then you see the net, we don't use net, so uh, that vineyard is, um, is our neighbor. And so you see that also La Serra is quite big. Mm -hmm. Then uh, in the video, you see again the soil. So again, it seems to be the same soil. It is correct because Brunate and La Serra have the very, very similar soil. So again, it's dry on the top, but when you dig a bit, you see that there is the humidity inside. So we have the same vines, Nebbiolo. We use the same clones. We use different clones, but quite the same. Uh, clones that are for the quality of the grape, not for the quantity. And again, the soil is the same. So the difference from La Serra and Brunate is the microclimate. As my father told you before, La Serra is the, in the top of the hill, so there is a lot of air, it's very fresh, and the, diff, the temperature from day and night is quite similar in summer. So this condition creates a very elegant wine and flower. In Brunate, we have this amphitheater, and then in the day, the temperature are very high, in the night are low. So the difference from day and night is high. And this condition create the noblest wine of La Morra, so more imperious Barolo. The tannins are more um, important and goes in all the mouth. So only the microclimate is the difference from these uh, two crew. Perfect. That's what you're doing uh, nowadays, no? Yes, I, I made these videos three days ago. So now we see uh, a part of Brunate. The driver is my, is he, his name is Igor. He works with us from 10 years. And now we starting to replant it a little part of Brunate because the vines were too old and so we decided to start to uh, renovate the population of plants. Now he's going with uh, um, this instrument that allowed us to take all the, ro the roots outside of the soil and then this morning we did it. By, by hand we pick up all the single roots and uh, took away from the, the vineyards, the past mm. vineyards. And now for about one year we will leave the, the soil free. We just put some um, herbs, special herbs to um, help the fertilization and then we will replant it in Nebbiolo in the future and from the beginning uh, life of the vines where they started to, to produce grapes we will destinate uh, that grape from Lange Nebbiolo and then after a few years we started to use, we will start to use for uh, Barolo but we will see how the maturation of the grapes will go. Mm -hmm. So we don't know when we will start Ninja, this. Talking about the age of the vines, what's the average age for the vines in La Serra and Brunate? It's more or less the same or there is Yeah, so, no, no, it's different. Um, we have two day, mm -hmm. two years of planting. Brunate, one year is 1978. Um, 
and we took uh, so this vintage the sorry sorry this vineyards was one one of that come from 1978 and the other age are 1987 so it's very old but for nebbiolo um, uh, it's like in the, the wine so the more uh, old are the, the vines then the grape is best it's like mm -hmm. in the it's also the, the barolo if, if you wait then the, the wine will become better la serra is a bit younger the, old, the older are from 1992, my brother's uh, vintage also, <laughs> and the others are uh, 20... Uh, 2002. 2002. 2002. Sorry, I have a big problem with the date in English, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's fine. now you can see my, my best assistant, my dogs in the vineyards. Uh -huh. And you see what we are doing in this day, why my father is uh, using the uh, zappa. Uh, so, so he's digging the, the soil. So she's Chiara, uh, my sister. We are, the suck we are doing the saccharine. So this, I don't know if the, um, the word is correct in English, but it means that we are removing the shot that come, come from the stump, so the, the, the big wood piece of the plant, and also the uh, double shot. Double shots mean that from one bud grow two shots. We do this work now because we want to balance the future canopy. So we don't want to have too much shot and too much leaf. And we, have, we, uh, uh, we are imagining how many bunch we will have in that plant. So we make uh, a, a job for, for single vines. So it change from one vine to mm -hmm. another. And we also are working for the future, for the next pruning in the next vintage. So we leave one shot on the stem in order to be able to uh, prune the vines in the future. So it's, it's quite a complicated job. It's very important to do now and also to do good because then we will have problems in the future. We're trying to have our vines balanced. So we want, we usually have the um, quantity of uh, leaf and grape that are balanced because if you have too much leaves, then the plants become uh, all the energy of the plants go to the leaves and the grapes are left behind. And the same, if you have too much uh, grape, then the, the leaf cannot um, bring this uh, energies uh, in the uh, right quantity to make all the grapes good. Mm -hmm. So uh, every single work we are doing in our vineyards from now until the, the um, harvest is focused to the balance. Okay. And uh, if you go a little behind in the video, I want to show you a very interesting thing. Il la farina rosso. Uh, Fer hormone. I have a question about the fer hormones, uh, by the way, if I can, since you're talking about fer hormones, I saw it. Uh, when do you put them on and when do they, how much do they last? Do you change them every six months or every year? No, we, we change every year and we put in uh, the beginning of, um, uh, of March because then the insect, will be, uh, the, the insect will be in the vineyards. But I just want to explain to everybody what is, you see the ro red rope, okay, it's not a rope. It's, um, it's similar to a rope we put in the, in the vines and this little piece of rope is full of uh, pheromones from against two insects of the, the vines, tignola and tignoletta. These insects come from uh, America, so <laughs> maybe I can bring you some if you want to back. <laughs> and these pheromones confuse the male, so they are not able to find the girls, the female, and they cannot reproduce. And so we have a very low population uh, of this insect, and so it's not a problem for the vines. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we put, uh, okay, so we have to put at the, at the beginning of March, because then this insect uh, will be able to reproduce. So we have to confuse it, him, it. How long does it last? Because I know it smells, I have it in my backyard. Um, so how long uh, does it last? One year. I mean, we just put now and then we remove in the pruning and then on the next vintage, we put again. Every row or, or in every plant? Is that in every row or in every vine? No, there is uh, a map. We have to put uh, um, 
10 piece in uh, one line, then we have to skip one line and go to the lines uh, down. So to make all the, be the vines, the vineyards, full of pheromones, but not too much. Then if you have too much pheromones, then you will bring all the insects in your vineyards. So you have to, to have the dose. And thanks to these pheromones, we don't have to do the uh, chemical um, insecticides. So it's a, a very organic way to control. Yeah, the, the winery is not organic or biodynamic certified, but this one could be considered as a one practice of this kind of uh, process or not? Yes. It's organic. It's, yes, the, this, this process is for, uh, we are not certified, but yeah. this uh, method of control the insect is for biological uh, viticulture. But technically, we are not certified because um, for the moment, uh, we are not able to manage all the vineyards with the biological law because they're very strict. And also because I think that in the biological, um, we use uh, almost all the product of biological law, but uh, I think that I, uh, the, this kind of law should change. So uh, I don't think that is, I think that every single producer should uh, manage his vineyards how he's believed, because they also in the biologic, you can use a lot of chemical products that I don't think that products should be used in the biological way. So I think that mm, I not really believe in that certification because also you have to pay the, the certification, uh, certification. Yes, you have to pay to have it. And I think that you, you should be biological because you you really believe in that not because yeah, yeah. Based on but uh, this technique uh, the red rope is one question on the group chat is that a common mm -hmm. practice in the area or is something uh, or it's something just between you and fabio <laughs> <laughs> well we we were the first to use it and uh, and uh, then we started to talk to uh, other producer because of course if all the hill is full of this uh, red rope, then the insect is not a problem for, for anyone. Mm -hmm. Then if you have just a little part of the vineyard without that rope, then you will have a lot of trouble. And so with our neighbor, we talk a, a lot. And now uh, almost everyone in, the, uh, in our area, I don't know in the old rural area, but I think it's becoming common and common. Yeah. But uh, could be better, I think. Um, Elisa, probably you can answer also this question, but it's anyway it's for everybody. Um, we were talking before uh, about what happened uh, to the Barolos in 2015-16 with the new vintage. What actually, uh, there is something that changed in the vineyards, the approach to the vineyards or that made different, uh, I mean the, the Brunate for example before from the Brunate now or La Serra, what, what changed? Changed something or not? Yeah, so, yeah, unfortunately, something is changed by the climate changing. So we see that uh, our, uh, in the past, uh, we see that uh, our vineyards have um, a strange uh, behavior. behavior. So. We, we wanted to analyze the problem and we see that we need to change our fertilization system. So we, now we are completely change our fertilization system. As I told you before, we uh, do a second fertilizer during the season by the grass. And also we starting to reduce the quantity of uh, fertilizers because there is a lot of sun. Vines are plants that love sun and so uh, we need to keep it a bit uh, stressed in order to have better quality of the plants, of the grape. And also the alcohol problem, because of course, if there is hot, then the plants can use the energy solar. So it's not, not hot, hot, sorry, the sun. So a lot of sun. And then the plants produce a lot of sugar from the grape. And then sugar become alcohol. So we needed to reduce the alcohol um, in the wines, and we also use less fertilization in the autumn. But we need a lot of, uh, of course, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not a uh, 
fast process. So we, we change our fertilization system in uh, like uh, in the 1998. So we started to uh, program um, more less quantity and everything in that in that in vintage. But we see the result in the 2000. Sorry, in 2008. Ah, sorry, because I, I in this project, this all this study did my mother. So I was at school and my father is telling me the <laughs> the date. <laughs> I know. Ah, you can join us. And she, uh, he, wrong date, 2008, sorry. And so uh, now we are seeing the, the results of lower alcohol and everything. Thank you, Edith. And then also, uh, so uh, our main difficult now is the climate change, that every vintage become uh, unique. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with introduction also with Barolo Lamorra, you also mm -hmm. change the way of selecting the grapes, no? Yeah, well, we, my, my mother decided to start the, um, <clears throat> for, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started to control the maturation of the Biolo since the beginning of the 21st century. We started to do <clears throat> a specific control that's it's um, that's you see how the tanni the tannins of the seed if, uh, are ready or not. So there is a panel that uh, eat these seeds and see how the tannins is. So is it is ready or not? And then also we see the color. How many uh, molecular of color will be in the wines uh, during the maceration? So all this complex analysis is called uh, um, phenolic maturity. And also we continue to see the te technological uh, parts. So the sugar, the pH, and the acidity. All these uh, analysis were did uh, since, since ever, since my, my parents started to work here. And they see that in, in the heart of Brunate, in the heart of La Serra, these uh, analysis were better. So in 2015, we wanted to go deeper and see why we're different. And especially we want to see if, if we just vinificate that part uh, in a different, no, sorry, in separately from the other part of the, vinta, of the, the um, vineyards and see if any difference is real also in the wine, not only in the vineyards. And the difference there was. And so we started to select Brunate and La Serra. So we do again all these analysis, and we we sell every vintage. We choose the best part of the hill. So it's not always the same. Of course, it's in the heart, and also thanks to the uh, the harvest by hand in little box of about twenty kilos, we can choose the bunch from from the vines, and we just take the best bunch, even if the the if that part is the best, we choose only the best grape, the best bunch. So it can happen that sometime we return from the second harvest to pick the few bunch that we decide to leave on the, on the plants. And then that bunch will destinate to La Morra. Perfect explanation. I have another question, Elisa. Between La Serra and uh, Brunate, do you have a selection of different uh, clones of uh, Nebbiolo? No, so we have polyclonian uh, vineyards, both in Brunate and La Serra, and we use the, uh, the same clones, but mixed. So, for example, we have um, one of our clones is called uh, Miquette. I mean, the name is very complex, it's like CVT203, it's like letters and numbers, but it's common. Uh called Miquette, uh, Elisa, Elisa. high quality grape. If you can, please See? try to not move that much, otherwise... Ah, yeah, sorry, I'm Italian. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Okay, please go ahead, please. We also have another clones that is focused to... Um, I think Elisa, you touched the antenna now. That's it. Don't uh, move your. Uh, compared to Miquette, too. Um, no, it's, uh, Elisa. Sì. Ti abbiamo perso un attimo. 
Puoi ripetere? Yeah, ripetere. sorry because I received a phone call and so my signal is now lower. Can you hear me? Now it's okay. Okay, perfect. Just if you so can start was... uh, from the name of the clone. Yeah, sorry. So I, I was saying that we have polyclonians vineyards. So it means that we have different clones in our vineyards, but the clones are, are the same for, for Brunate and La Serra. I was saying that one of the clones is uh, called, is usual called Miquet, and is a clone that is focused on uh, quality. Produce a very, very few bunch from uh, every single uh, vines. And then we also have another uh, clone that is very good in production of tannins, of, the, of tannins in, in the grapes, but uh, produce uh, is a bit more uh, quantity compared to Miquet. So um, now that we are replanting Brunate, I've, I've done uh, a huge study to choose the best clones and also the best good stock. And so we will see in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now this so, one is the uh, interest of the I one think... now. Yeah, see, okay. yes. Hello everybody, I hope you are fine, also in this coronavirus period. So I'm Andrea and I'm the new generation together with my, daughter, with my sister. So before you saw the view from our cellar, from La Mora, okay. and from there you can see almost all the Parolo area, except the towns of Parolo and Monforte that are uh, behind the building. And the yellow building that you can see is uh, our house and also uh, the ground floor is uh, entirely occupied by the, the cellar. So now we are moving on a medieval tower that was built in the 1300s. And this tower uh, now is where our aging cellar is. Okay, we are entering in our aging cellar now and it's full of Slavonian oak barrel that are using for the aging of the Barolo. All these barrels are full of Barolo and by law Barolo must spend 18 months in food that could be chestnut or oak, both the oak, the Slavonian or the French ones. We are using only Slavonian oak because we, pref we prefer the porosity of the Slavonian oak that is more tight so the micro oxygenation that happens is lower and we can still uh, do the 24 months of aging as uh, in the old way. We can do that also because our barrels are a little bit old. We have some barrels that are from the 60s, from, uh, some from the 70s, from the 80s, from the 90s, from all the, the, the decades. And the average size is 27 hectoliters. We go from 18 to 46 hectoliters. So uh, we uh, can, our Barolo can spend 24 months in this barrel because we use the wood only as an instrument. We don't want to extract uh, uh, the aromas of the oak or the, or, the, or the tannins of the oak. We prefer to work with the natural tannins that the Biolo grape has, and it has a lot. So we work with a longer maceration to extract and obtain the best tannins from the grape. And after this process, the wine will rest in this barrel for 24 months. So you can see there, Barolo Brunate 2018. This is a 32 hectoliters tank uh, barrel and the wine will stay there until July because as every six months, uh, about in July and during Christmas evening, uh, uh, during the Christmas period, we move all the barrels with a single vineyard of a single vineyard, for example, Barolo Brunate 2018, and we uh, create a huge tank with the whole vintage inside. And then we split again the Barolo in different barrels, so the average of the age of the barrels and uh, the average of the size of the barrel is the same during all the uh, vintages. And thanks to that, we obtain uh, that the bottles of uh, Barolo Brunate, the first bottle and the last bottles of the same vintage, 
are exactly the same because we do this process that is called uh, as the single mass. We can translate it as the single mass uh, many times, and the last time is before uh, to bottle it. So we can go on. Uh, this is uh, the door uh, behind that door uh, is where we are actually now in our uh, tasting room. We are uh, doing this talking from there. We can go downstairs and below uh, we have newer barrels. We have those barrels from uh, uh, 2004 and the, the one on the right side are from 2019, from last year. So we have newer barrels because we need the newer oak for another wine that we produce that is Barbera. Only Barbera and Barolo of Margherini are the two wines that spend time in oak. The other wines that we produce, the Dolcetto and the Nebbiolo, for example, doesn't spend time in oak, just stainless steel. So uh, these are house, uh, these barrels were built in Austria. The, the older one was, were, was all from Italy. But now in Italy, you cannot find the best quality barrels. You have to go to close to Vienna to find the, the best uh, Slavonian oak barrels. Those are from Stockinger, a very famous uh, producer. And the others that, you, that are in the same room are for another producer that is called Pauschka, another of the best, together with Stockinger in this kind of, uh, of barrels. Thank you, Andrea. Elisa, no just a quick question for you before going to the yeah. lineup. When you replant the Brunate, will you graft or use new shoots? Yeah, unfortunately, we, we, we must graft all the vines because we have the phylloxera in our soil. And so if we don't graft the vines, then the phylloxera will kill the roots of the European vines. So it's, uh, we have to, every single producer in Europe must graft the vines. But, but when we, start, we talk about the vines, I will show you a little uh, uncommon vines. <laughs> uh, okay. So now we can talk a little bit about the, the wines, one, one by one, yes. if you agree. Sure, or if there is any question, we, we can answer them. We are glad to answer them. Go ahead, Manuel. Any question? question for, uh, for Elisa from Canada, from Victoria, Canada, regarding the, the frost that mm -hmm. happens in the Brunate vineyards. Can you give us more information about that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, of course. So. <clears throat> Yeah, so in, uh, nowadays there is no more this frost during the harvest period because... Um, no, by... it's, not, it's not frost. What... No, wait, wait. But... Okay. So you, you want to know about the, the problem of the... So you want to talk about the name of Brunate of the frost? Yes. Ah, okay, okay. So uh, this is um, it's called in Italian is pruina. I don't know the English name. It's something is a substance on that cover all the skin of the the grapes. the grapes. And so this um, substance. Yes. Can I speak? So this substance protects the the grapes against the sun. So it's come from during the mid. Um, uh, mid of August when the barrels start to change color and then uh, you don't see the the, bar, the bunch that are violet but especially from Nebbiolo you see the, this bunch that are seem is like you have the violet behind and then you have the the gray up so but this just the, the story of the name of course um, if you go in the vineyards you don't see the bunch that are white like there is this frost but it's how in, in the image of the people it was like frost and so they start to call it brinate because brina in Italian is the frost, the morning frost. So I hope I answered the question. I believe so. <laughs> okay. From um, what I can read, it says it's kind of fungus. It's against the fungus. So. Uh, yeah, also, but more it's, it's for against the, the sun. It's like the sun 
exactly uh, cream for us because then uh, the fungus can attack the leaf even if you have the pruina on the, the bunch. And then, then you don't have the um, attacks of fungus uh, from the mid of August because the, the seeds, sorry, the, the, the grapes stop to uh, photosynthesis. So to make the photosynthesis. Well, so if you have the, the bunch that when is uh, green, it means that it uh, take the sun and produce energy. When it start to change color, he stop this process. So the fungs cannot uh, attack the, 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 the bunch. Mm -hmm. um, Manuel. Or, uh, I don't know who. From yes. That. Just to give a few words on this new lineup, on the new packaging. Yes. Sure. So, um, usually, when a winery has something new to say, uh, it's, it's common to change the label or change the image. Uh, we have a lot of things to say. So, uh, also in our case, we decided to update all our, our labels. Uh, we didn't want to make something fancy or something modern. We want to maintain our classical uh, image. And you can see uh, the line in, in, in this picture. Uh, the first in your, um, in the first row in your left side uh, has this uh, yellow uh, paint stripe. And that's the new label for the Moscato Diasti. It was to show something more uh, easy, more funny, and uh, this is uh, the, the, the only label that has some characteristic uh, different. Um, it's interesting because Moscato di Asti uh, is uh, a sweet wine. It's a low alcohol wine, only 5% alcohol. And it is a wine that, uh, with, together with my wife, we started uh, making it in 1996. Uh, actually, in 1995, we were looking for some vineyards in the Barbaresco area for Dolcetto. At that time, Dolcetto, everybody wanted Dolcetto. I remember also that the Dolcetto grape was more expensive to the Barolo grape, to the Nebbiolo for Barolo grape. And uh, everybody wanted that. And uh, we were looking in the area of Barbaresco because the Dolcetto, that, uh, the grapes that grows in that area, are more fruitier and have a lot more aromas. And that's why um, I was looking for Dolcetto vines there. But at the end, I fell in love with a property, with a farm, uh, which uh, I, it was winter, so all the wines were already pruned. And uh, I asked, which, do you have Dolcetto here? And the owner said, yes, I have some Dolcetto. Uh, and then and what is all these vineyards? And they said, it's Moscato. Moscato. Well, I don't like Moscato. So this was the first thing I didn't like because I didn't like this kind of wine, the Moscato. But I said, okay, no, no problem. We will buy it anyway. Maybe we will replant it with uh, the, the Moscato with Dolcetto and we will see. But it was during the first harvest, 1996, when I started eating the grapes during the harvest. And, and they were amazing. It, they were so good that I said, well, this is what the Moscato wine should taste. And I ask, I taste all the Moscato that were produced at that time, and I find out which were my favorites. And I ask my consultants so to, 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 to see if we could make something with the taste of the fresh grapes. And my uh, consultant, Armando, uh, said, yes, of course we can do. And we start experimenting and with the first vintages, until we found the right uh, uh, mixture and the right process of making or the vinification of this wine. So today I think uh, drinking my Moscato is like eating a fresh grape. And this is the sensation I want to, to give to the people, to have a wine to smile at the end. Then we have uh, the second wine. Uh, actually, I'm talking about the whites. Uh, the second wine is Arroero Arnais. And why are an Arnais? I mean, we are not, it's, Arnais is not, uh, the Roero Arnais is not even in the Lange, it's in the Roero area. Uh, the origin of this, um, of this vineyard comes from uh, my wife's cousin. Uh, 
uh, actually part of her family from her, her uh, grandmother uh, were born and are originating from Montaldo Roero. So his cousin had these wines and he said, hey, Luisa, I'm getting older and it's becoming tougher for me to manage my vineyards. And could you help us to, to manage this vineyard? And because together with their name, she had also some Nebbiolo. We said, okay, we can do it. We can manage it and you are there. You can do all the work you can. And we send our men, our force uh, to, to help you when, it's, when you need it. Uh, during in these years, in, uh, actually it was 2005, uh, we bought <clears throat> all these uh, uh, two hectares. Actually, there are two hectares of Arnais now. And we start vinifying it by ourselves. Uh, this was also something new because uh, to me making a white wine uh, to, and my wife as well was the first time and uh, we didn't know how to do it. And it was very interesting because with the knowledge we achieved with the Moscato, we put it uh, together to make a dry white wine. I think uh, the Arnaise is a, a very nice wine. It, it has its own specific moment. For example, which wine would you uh, pair with artichokes or asparagus? Uh, this wine is the best wine you can pair with those, uh, um, with those vegetables. Also, if you have uh, roast campi or uh, um, oysters, uh, if you drink it with uh, this Arroyo Arnaise, it's beautiful and goes very, very well. So now I have also my wine for my oysters. That's why we make uh, this wine as well. <laughs> Then Elisa will talk to you about uh, the Dolcetto and the Nebbio and, and the Barbera. So she will talk to you about these two wines. Yeah, so before we, uh, are, talking, before we are talking about the graft vines, and I told you that everyone must graft the vines, but we, fortunately, have two kinds of Dolcetto. I mean, it's the same Dolcetto d'Alba, but one comes from grafted vines and the others come from ungrafted vines. So 100% European vines. We don't know why we have this uh, portion of uh, vineyards. Maybe because it's in an uncommon position for vineyards. It's in the uh, higher part of uh, uh, La Morra. It's, in, it's called Berry, the, the um, village, so sub-village. And so it's a fraction of La Morra. I don't know if uh, there is a translation. And so um, this little piece of uh, land were surrounded by wood. So we call the, the wine Boschi di Berry, that translate is wood of berry, berry. And so also the soil is different from La Morra, where come from the other kind of dolcetto, because it's a rich of sand. So probably the position and the, the sand in the soil killed the, the, the phylloxera. And so these uh, vineyards survived to the attack of phylloxera. So it's very, very old uh, vineyards come from the end of the eight, uh, 18th century. Uh, sorry, 19th century. And so uh, it's an uncommon dolcetto. So if you compare the, if you drink these two dolcetto together, you compare them, you see that the dolcetto fontanazza it's more the common dolcetto. So it's the drinkable, the easier, the, the wine that you can drink with everything. With, uh, um, with, you don't have problem to, to pair it with food because dolcetto is perfect with uh, every kind of food. And also for, for our region, dolcetto is the, um, in the past was like the water because we didn't have the drinkable water, but we have the drinkable wines. So we drink, we, we were used to drink dolcetto also for breakfast. The very uh, old people in La Morra are used to have breakfast with a glass of dolcetto, uh, a piece of bread and a, sli a slice of sausages. I will do in the future, but now I'm not ready. <laughs> and so it's uh, the everyday wines. Well, dolcetto boschi di berri, so the ungrafted um, uh, vines. So it's a bit uncommon dolcetto because it's more structured and also uh, the harvest period is different. It's about uh, one or two weeks later than the, the first dolcetto. 
and also all the vinification process is longer, needs more time to be ready. In fact, the Boschi di Berri, the new vintage, is released uh, in September, while the other Docetto is released in April. So it needs more time. And also, this is very, very untypical things for Docetto, can aging a bit. So one day we tried a Docetto that had uh, nine years old, we opened it, I was a bit scared, but I was shocked because the dolcetto were perfect. I mean, if it was a blind tasting, maybe I wouldn't recognize the dolcetto, but the bottle was perfect. It was like a baby Barolo. So very uncommon dolcetto. And then the last bottle of the first row is Barbera. Barbera Chabot Cameran, Camerano. So the famous pink house that I show you in the video of La Serra. Because um, in the lower part of the hill, like 10 lines of La Serra area, are, uh, is planted Barbera. So a part of Barbera comes from La Morra, and the other part comes from uh, Neville, where there is the Moscato. So we have the, <clears throat> from the Barbera that comes from La Morra, we have the structure. And then from the Barbera that comes from Neville, we have the perfume in the uh, freshness. Combine these two different grapes, I mean, it's the same, but different uh, orig origin of the grape. We have our Barbera, that is very uh, fresh, but also have a structure. And then it's very interesting because Barbera is a grape that doesn't have any tannins, so it's only acid at the beginning. So need a bit of <clears throat> time to be ready, and also a little uh, of, wood. So my brother told you before that we need young wood for Barbera because it needs tannins. And so Barbera takes the tannins from the, bar, from the wood of the barrels, then the acidity is perfect combined to the tannins that come from the wood. It makes this very balanced wine. And Elisa, could you so, give us a, there is a kind of percentage between, I mean, how much comes from La Serra and how much from the other area to make the Barbera? Yes, so uh, from uh, uh, Neville is 1.5 hectares, while in La Serra is uh, less than uh, half hectare. Okay, so it's more from Neville than uh, La Serra. Yes, yes. Okay. But the, 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 um, the soil is very different from La Serra, from, sorry, yeah, from La Serra to Neville, so, um, this, so it was it I told you before. Thank you. Okay, okay. so Andrea will let you in the nebbiolo words. Yes, <laughs> I can go on with the, with the other line. So we can start with the Lange Nebbiolo La Sarina. It's a pretty different Lange Nebbiolo because we are one of the few producers that still make a Nebbiolo without oak. Almost all the producers in our area do uh, 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 their Nebbiolo spends time in, uh, in barrels, in barriques or in big barrels. We, uh, from the 60s, so from the 60s, we still do uh, uh, Lange Nebbiolo only stainless steel because we love this very fresh and approachable uh, aroma and taste that the real, uh, that is the real taste of the Nebbiolo grape. We don't want to make uh, a little Barolo or a little Barbaresco. And we prefer to do a um, kind of Barolo in blue cheese. Because, uh, especially in the past, we didn't own uh, some vineyards that uh, are for Nebbiolo that are not also for Barolo. So our entire uh, property of Nebbiolo are in La Serra and in Donate. So uh, we decided, my ancestor decided, to uh, use the newer vines to make the Nebbiolo. So for the first 10 vintages, we are still uh, using the uh, new grapes to make the Lange Nebbiolo. And then after the 10th year, year, we use the same grape to uh, make the Barolo. That's because the, deep, uh, the roots of the, uh, of the vines are not so deep in the soil. So uh, the roots of the Barolo, of uh, the Biolo uh, vines can reach 15 meters below the, 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 the soil. So they reach different uh, uh, kind of soil and make more complex structure. And that's why we wait 10 years to, to use the grapes for the barrel. 
then we can move on and I will talk a little bit about, again, about the, the new uh, Barolo uh, from La Mora and the other two single vineyard Barolo. Uh, the, the project of the Barolo uh, from La Mora started with a question that I, I made to my father in 2015 and I asked him how we could improve uh, the quality of our single vineyard Barolo. And he got quite angry <laughs> and he said, we are doing very good Barolos, why we have to improve them? And I come in a little bit and then I explain what uh, I meant. Uh, I found that uh, some producers did uh, a better job with their single vineyard and I asked them just if we can improve the quality of uh, our single vineyard, of our Brunate in particular. And we, uh, we didn't talk about barriques because we, uh, myself and also my sister, we uh, really believe in the traditional style in the, the uh, low oak wines or low oak barolos. So uh, we talked about a selection that we had uh, to make in the vineyards, which changed the way in which uh, we were used uh, to transport the grapes. Before we used to use uh, wagons to transport uh, the grapes from the vineyard to the cellar. Now we are using little boxes. So thanks to those little boxes, we can select uh, the best batches of Brunate and of La Serra to make the single vineyards. The non-selected batches are blended together, mixed to form a new wine that is called Barolo del Comune di La Mora. We uh, had this idea to represent uh, La Mora as the most elegant of the uh, common of the Barolo because La Mora is the higher in elevation between the villages and is, is also known as the most elegant part of the Barolo area. So uh, we think, I think that we uh, reached our goal and we presented a very uh, approachable and easier Barolo uh, especially in the aromas that are more in the flower air in the, in the fruit. We can represent very well La Mora as a village, as a region with this wine. It's not a wine, a Barolo, that you have to wait 10 years before to open the bottle and drink it. It reached the top, the peak, uh, quite earlier, after five, six years, and will maintain it for 15 and more years after that. While La Serra is known uh, as the most elegant single vineyard in the most elegant village. So, should be the most elegant Barolo ever. But uh, uh, I think that this kind of elegance is more uh, in the aging. Uh, because La Serra is one of the few single vineyards that uh, will maintain uh, the aromas of fruit, uh, red fruit, of roses, of violet uh, during the aging. Many Barolo lose this part when uh, they age in favor of uh, the tertiary and aromas. La Serra will maintain all his aroma from the whole history during the aging. And then we uh, can have this uh, a little talk about Brunate. Brunate is a more unique single vineyard because it's in La Mora, it's mainly in La Mora, but it's not so uh, gentle. It's more austere, it's more balsamic, more in the ethereal aroma, in the incense, uh, in this kind of mentholated aromas. All the three Barolos are made in the same way. We do the same vinification, so a very long maceration. We still do, as uh, uh, we were used to do in 1930s, up to 45 days of maceration after the fermentation. So almost two months in total of contact between skin and wines. This very long maceration is very useful for us to, for two main things. Uh, firstly, the color, which uh, is stabilized in a natural way, because the skin in a uh, first moment releases color to the wine. Then after a couple of weeks, they absorb it back and release it again. So in this way, the color is stabilized in a natural way. And thanks to that, we unfine and unfiltered all our parolos. And the second and most important thing is are the molecule of tannins that join together during the maceration and form a longer chain of tannins. And long chain of tannins means uh, more uh, sweet, sweeter tannins because are, are not so pungent in your tongue and also more complex tannins. And thanks to these uh, very long chains, we don't have to use new oak. 
we can use the, our big and old oak barrels because we don't have to extract more of them of this time. We just have to work with them and to uh, give a very uh, slow uh, micro oxidation so they can combine and evolve and become even more uh, interesting. And at the end, a few words about the Barolo Chinato. Barolo Chinato is a very historical product for us and for our region because it's the real Barolo. Before uh, 1861, when uh, Italy become, became Italy actually, uh, all the Barolo was produced in a different way. It was a sweet wine. It was, uh, uh, in this wine we can find now in uh, Barolo Chinato. The word chinato at the end that refer to the quinine that is used to protect and to avoid uh, a second fermentation in bottle uh, it uh, was added after uh, the dry Barolo reached the market. So now Barolo chinato is more used for mixology, for cocktails, and uh, as uh, an amaro, as a digestivo after the meal. Uh, and is one of the best uh, wines uh, to be paired with chocolate. So with the cert is quite good. And it is make, uh, uh, we, to obtain Barolo Quinquinato nowadays, we have to obtain Barolo, and then we can add some sugar and some alcohol, and then an infusion of herbs, natural herbs and roots. And the quinine is the most important of those. Every producer has his own recipe. We have uh, the, the rhubarb, the, the cardamom, and different herbs. And our recipe is one of the oldest because we found our ancestor recipe uh, in, for, from the very past, and we are still using uh, this recipe as a guide. Uh, we change a little bit the taste uh, to, to have a more modern taste and to adapt it uh, to century after. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. I think that that's. Uh, oh, you're welcome. So if there is any question, we, we can answer. Anyone? I think we had already I have, many I have questions. a quick one. A quick one. Hello, uh, hello, hello, Manuel, hello. Andrea, hello. Elisa. Ciao. Ciao. Um, I was just curious. Um, I wasn't aware that you, that you own that uh, lower, lower plot uh, in Brunate. Is that, in fact, in the Barolo zone and not in the uh, uh, Lamora zone? And if so, uh, do you bottle that separately or do you sell it to? Uh, what goes on with that lower plot? <clears throat> Actually, that lower plot is always part of the Brunate. So it is considered the same as the others but uh, it is in Barolo town. So it is, uh, it's in a different, I mean, I pay the taxes of that plot to Barolo and not to La Morra. For the other plots, I pay the taxes to La Morra. This is the difference mainly. But uh, they want the, the, the quality, the soil and, and the hill and the sun exposition is the same. Uh, we, it, that plot goes into the Brunate. Uh, actually, in, in 1987, uh, that's before I was in the winery, uh, they tried to make a, 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 a new, a, a grand crew, so a crew from the crew, and they called that uh, Brunate Canum, because this area is known in, locally as Canum. Uh, in 1986, there was a big hailstorm, uh, actually, La Serra was destroyed and part of Brunate was destroyed. The part that survived was this Canum uh, plot. And we, uh, they discovered that it has a bigger uh, complexity respect to the others. And uh, they decided to, to make this grand crew. But then the problem was how they say it to the press. They say that uh, they, they, they separate this plot from the others uh, to make a better wine. And the question was, then the Brunate is becoming worse if you remove the best part of it. So when I, I listened to these uh, comments, I immediately stopped making that Brunate Canon. So uh, it was only 1987 when you can see this special and some labels, very, very few of the production uh, went into the market. And since then, always Brunate and only Brunate. Thank you, Mona. Any other question or not? 
It seems no. Manuel, Andrea, Elisa, Excellent. thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Uh, thanks to everybody for, for listening. Thank you so Maybe yes. we, I hope we were not too boring. No, no. never. No, not at all. It was great. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you. Bye to everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.